Here in the great plaza of Copan, the 13th king of the dynasty erected a whole series of large monuments called stela, one of which is behind me here. These were really important commemorative uh, monuments that uh, emphasized stations in the Maya calendar and the ceremonies that went on involving the king on those days. The king is shown on all of these monuments, like the one here, with all of this ceremonial regalia. And he's shown actually in the specific setting of a place called Macaw Mountain, maybe one of the sacred hills around Copan. There's an inscription on the side that tells us the date and also the kinds of things going on on that day. We can read off the date in the Maya calendar as 9 15 0 0 0. And those three zeros at the end of the date are key for telling us that it's what we know as a period ending, a very important station in the calendar when all sorts of things were going on, probably right here in this plaza with lots of people from the community. The inscription goes on and records some of the ceremonies that happened on that day on the other side of the stele. We can read virtually the entire inscription here. From the very top, it says, it was erected the stone. It is the image of the Macaw Mountain Lord. It ended the 15 katuns. He casts incense. He is the impersonator of this deity who's named in these two glyphs. And then with the ending of the inscription, it tells us he is the 13th successor in the dynasty, ruler 13. Then it gives his personal name. And this glyph we only deciphered a few years ago. His name was Washaklahun Uba Kawil. And once we were able to read that glyph, we had finally resurrected it. This stone monument could be one of the key pieces of the Copan puzzle. It shows two seated figures, one here and one here, who flank a column of hieroglyphs. There's a date recorded in the Maya system as three Chikchan, the third day of the month Wo. And the event they're commemorating is he sat for accession to office. He was seated into some sort of position. Well, who was seated in the position? This figure over here is Yash Pasach, the 16th king of the dynasty. And according to some of the records, such as Alter Q, the last one. But this fellow over here could well be his successor. In other words, he could be the 17th king. This date corresponds to, in our calendar, the year 822. And so we believe that this altar could be the very last stone monument ever produced here in Copan. When John Stevens came here about 160 years ago, he speculated that the inscriptions contained royal history, that it was history written in stone. And it turned out he was absolutely right. He had no evidence for this, but he had a good instinct, I think. And right behind me is the great hieroglyphic stairway of Copan, which is perhaps the biggest single text in the world, certainly the longest text from pre-Columbian America. And carved on it was the complete royal history of Copan, giving all of the king's names, all of the dates, and it encapsulates everything that we need to know about Copan history. Most of the inscriptions that we have are written in stone. And places like Copan and, and other sites have lots and lots of texts to work with. The hieroglyphic stairway from Copan right behind me is a really great example. It took about 100 years of concerted effort by a lot of different people to start to get the decipherment going. And nowadays, we can read about 80% of the inscriptions that are legible. And uh, that's quite a change from a number of years ago. We've had a lot of lucky breaks along the way. One of them is that uh, we know the language in which it's written. A lot of Mayan people still live today speaking Mayan languages. Um, and also, one of the clues that was sort of like a Rosetta Stone for us was the discovery of a manuscript by a Spanish priest named Landa, who actually wrote down a little bit about the hieroglyphic system and, and the way it was structured. He didn't really understand it. But scholars about 50 years ago began working on it and eking out clues that really told us the way the writing worked and the, the real structure that allowed us to crack the code. One of the first things that was deciphered about 100 years ago was the calendar system. And uh, I have an example of it here from an ancient Maya book a facsimile of one, uh, where we have an example of a date written with five numbers using bars and dots. That's the way the Maya represented numbers between 1 and 19. A bar was a 5, and a single dot was a 1. So for example, here we have a column that reads 8, 11, 8, 7, and then 0. The 0 is this sort of football-shaped element here. 
Now, this is a date in the calendar using a place notation system. It's giving us a, a big number of days. The bottommost number is a single day, and here there are none of those. Now, 20 days make up the next higher unit, and there are seven of those. 18 of these periods of 20 days make up the next higher period, and that's 360 days, almost a year. 20 of those make up the next higher period, so that's 7,200 days, and then 20 of those make the next one, and that's 144,000 days each. But these numbers tell us how many of those periods we have. So we have a lot of time here, a lot of numbers of days expressed. Now, this big number is the number of days that we add to the beginning point of the Maya calendar, which uh, in the correlation that most people accept nowadays, fell on the day August the 13th, 3114 BC. And this was far earlier than any site like Copan or any uh, real Maya civilization existed. So we don't know why it existed that early, why that day was picked to be the starting point. It's uh, still a mystery, but uh, that's when time began for the ancient Maya. In the early days of Maya archaeology, uh, really before the glyphs could be deciphered, it was thought that the inscriptions contained a lot of information about uh, the calendar, about the planets, astronomy, a lot of kind of esoteric information for the priests to read and contemplate. And uh, about 1960 or so, things really changed. There was a woman working at the Peabody Museum at Harvard named Tatyana Proskriakov. She had been studying the Maya for many, many years. And she really came ac across a breakthrough that, that changed the entire field. She was using the inscriptions from one site called Piedras Negras in Guatemala. And she noticed that the monuments there were all divided up into groups of time periods that corresponded more or less to a human lifetime. Uh, she reasoned out that the earliest date in these groups was a birth date, the latest one would be a death date, and then one in the middle somewhere would be an accession to kingship. And it turned out she was absolutely right. And she single-handedly transformed our field uh, into a, a, a one that studied history. She brought Maya history uh, from obscurity right out into the open. And so today at places like Copan, we can talk about kings, their families, their battles, their, their uh, lives in ways that we never thought possible. Uh, and uh, it's really been an amazing experience just in the wake of Priscuriakov's work to bring all the strands of history together. And uh, that's really what Copan archaeology is all about right now. Ever since we realized this was a king list of Copan, the first figure in the list was always mysterious. Uh, he's seated not on his name glyph, but on a glyph that simply says Ahau, or king, or lord. Uh, and he seems kind of an anonymous figure. He's also dressed strangely. He has a goggle-like device over his eyes. He has a square shield on his arm, um, and some fancy elements in his headdress. And some of these parts of his costume are actually more Mexican than they are Maya. So he's always seemed to be a strange figure from the very beginning. Now, back in 1986, when I was here conducting a tour of Copan, we stopped at Ultra Q and talked about it, and I realized all of a sudden that the headdress actually has his name glyph. There's a big bird back here with long tail feathers, and that's a Quetzal bird called Uk in Maya. The head of the bird has circles around the eye, which mark it as a macaw, which is mok. And then these two little things on the front of its headdress read yash and also in. So we have all of the elements of the name inich, yash, kuk, mo. And that's the name of the founder of Copan. We finally had the name of the first. The top of Alter Q here tells the story of yash, kuk, mo and how he came to Copan, really. It begins up here with a date, and it's a date that comes around the early 5th century. And it says that on that particular day in that time, he took the emblems of office, he took the kingship. The place where he took that kingship is recorded in the next glyph, and we've known for a long time that this glyph has some sort of connection to central Mexico. It may not be the name of Teotihuacan, but it's at least, at least some place uh, connected to that area. Then we have his name here, and then the date three days later, and three days later, he leaves that location. The inscription goes on to say something really remarkable. 153 days after he leaves this place where he's become a king, then 
he, on this day, he rests his legs or rests his feet. And he is the West Lord. It's a title that Yash Kukmo has throughout his references to Kopan. And then finally it says, Kuli Ushwiti, he arrived at Kopan. So I think the conclusion from this is that Yash Kukmo came a long way before he arrived at Kopan, and he probably originated and took the emblems of office. Ezra II depicts all 16 kings of Kopan, but it's more than just a visual king list of the site. We have four kings on each four sides of this square altar. And we have to remember that the Maya worldview was one that was essentially square with its cardinal directions and a symmetry that was reflected precisely on this altar. This wasn't lost on the King Yashbasa, the 16th ruler who dedicated this monument. He wanted to depict his entire dynastic ancestry in the context of the cosmos. And above all, he wanted to show his, his descent from the founding king, King Ichiyash Kukmo. And he does this on this side wonderfully. He receives the emblems of office from the founder, almost as if the ancestor is a contemporary figure. There's a profound sense of destiny, I think, reflected in this, this presentation of history. Uh, a circle is closed. There's an idea of a beginning and an end, as if anything that comes after the 16th ruler is somehow out of order or would begin some sort of new history, some new sense of a beginning. The simple stone monument is actually the earliest oil carving we have from Kopan. It depicts on one side the founder, King Ichiyash Kukmo, in a near contemporary portrait, and his son, Ruler II, flanking this inscription that is still very difficult to read in many ways. But what's interesting about this stone is that it sets the stage for other monuments, such as Altar Q, where we have Yash Kukmo shown as the beginning point. Here, there's just the two kings. Yet Ruler Two is relying on his father, much in the same way Yash Basa relies on Yash Kukmo on Altar Q. The monument commemorates the beginning of a great Maya cycle called the Bakhtun. In fact, it's the ninth Bakhtun in Maya history. It seems to have been the time when Kopan's history really began, when the founder Yash Kukmo arrived shortly before, and Ruler Two, his son, together they seem to celebrate this time. It was a time of great a ceremony of great cosmological importance that the people of Kopan at that time were well aware of, no doubt. So there's good reason to believe that these two kings saw this as an opportunity to represent themselves as great cosmological powers in and of themselves, people who would uh, oversee the passing of time in this beginning of the new Both of the kings depicted on the stone have their name list in their headdresses and also in the text. But the founder's name, King Ichiyash Kukmo, is really the only one of the two we can read. Uh, I think the reason for that is because the Ketsal bird, the Makar bird, these are symbols we can recognize and attach words to. But the name glyph of Ruler Two has elements and symbols in them that we can't recognize and make it very difficult to read. Someday we may well decipher his name, but for now we can just call him the second ruler, Ruler Two. Stila 63 is the earliest dated stila from Kopan and it records a very important date in the Maya calendar. There's a long inscription on the front, and it has these five periods of the long count, each with a number associated with it. And here we have nine bastuns, zero katuns, zero tuns, zero winals, and zero kings. In other words, this is the beginning point of nine bastuns, nine zero 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 zero, an extremely important period in Maya history. A Bakhtun only comes about every 400 years or so. So they commemorated this time period by erecting this stila above where the Matmat -Mat marker was. And it was also the time of the beginning of the Kopan dynasty. This probably isn't a coincidence that the beginning of the Bakhtun was also the beginning of the dynasty. The stila was discovered in a building that was constructed on top of the Matmat -Mat building in the marker that commemorated Yash Kukmo. And we believe that it was a place that was accessible for well over 200 years. People would come in and burn and present offerings, presumably, to this stone that was commemorating the beginning of the ninth Bakhtun. We see evidence of the burning, actually, on this part of the stila, this darkening here of some of the glyphs as the remnants of the soot and the carbon from that time. And we know that this was, therefore, a place of great ceremonial importance for centuries commemorating the beginning of the dynasty. The site of the monument has an inscription that has some key information about the history of Kopan and the early kings. We have to look at the glyphs on a bit sideways here, but we have the name of the second ruler here written very clearly. 
And then reading down, we have a glyph that says, you ne, you ne, the child of the man, the child of the father. The name of the father is the very last glyph down below, and that's the name of Kinikshash Kukumo. So ruler two was the son of the first king.